the COVID tests yeah. at all. So uh, it's going well. I was able to do a little outreach on science and faith. Have about 30 students come. Mm. So that was great. Yeah. You're on getting, campus. You're in class. Uh, I, there was a separate event. I, that I met for your I invited my class. That's right. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. All right, we're in Luke today, Luke chapter 9, continuing on. And uh, we're not going to read all the parts of, if you have a Bible handy, that that will really work for you today. And I'll rely on some of your knowledge of these passages, if you pre-read it or just familiar with it. We're going to start with Ascending of the Twelve. I'm really excited. We're going to, I think a big part of this passage is the transfiguration, but we're going to work our way up to that. So, the sending of the twelve, uh, what were the twelve, if you could just name off, some of the things they were given, and some of the things they were restricted from taking. So they couldn't take whatever they wanted, but they were given certain things. Anyone? Power. Power. Yeah, that's big. So power and authority definitely need that. Power to cast out demons. Yes. Verse 1, gave them power and authority over all the demons and to heal diseases. What else? He gave them, uh, they didn't go by themselves. Yeah, a uh, partner. And a partner. They were to proclaim the kingdom of God. Proclaim the kingdom of God. Yeah, so they had power and authority to do that as well. <coughs> no bread, no money. Uh, almost nothing. <laughs> only, only a carry-on. Only a carry-on, yeah, nothing to check in. Uh-huh. Not even a staff. Yeah, not even a staff. It'll be a, we're going to, later in chapter 10, we're going to see the same of the 70, which will be slightly different. But here they could make almost nothing. <coughs> In fact, when uh, uh, Peggy and I and there was other folks doing the same, taking some students on missions, sometimes we would take the train to the further city. If you can imagine, we're taking the train, and here's our destination. We kept going, stopped here, and we would study usually, usually Luke 10, the saying of the 70, but this was really similar. And then we would send them in twos or sometimes threes to come back and meet us at our destination city. Uh, so they wouldn't be taking hardly anything, uh, but they were kind of living out this passage. And usually, for almost all of them at the end of the uh, mission trip when we would share, that would be the highlight of it. It kind of started them off on the right foot. Like, oh, we can trust God. Most of them said it's the most we've prayed of in our lives. Yeah, the most fervent prayer um, you can imagine. Yeah. So, can imagine, and you know, these they were more in their host country, so it might feel a little more comfortable, but they're going maybe to cities that they're less comfortable with. So, okay. They were only, they were not to go to the Gentiles. Yeah, that what didn't happen yet, we weren't ready yet, according to Jesus. So, they were uh, focused in a particular area. And he gave them some pretty good instructions. Oh, yeah, say more. Yeah. Uh, take the mic if you don't want to talk. Oh. So it so makes it through the video. Oh, there yeah, we go. He gave them some good instructions. Uh, he didn't just say, head out. He told them, you know, when you go there, stay there, mm -hmm. don't depart. Um, and. Uh, and then he also gave some instructions about if they weren't received well, what to do. Yeah. So, so they had some instruction. So uh, just to ask, since you mentioned it, if, so if they weren't received well, they were supposed to shake the dust off their feet. Does that mean they were unsuccessful? Yeah. No. Why not? If people didn't listen to them. They're not responsible for the response. They're responsible to be faithful to what they were sent to do. Right. Right. So our uh, success is defined a little bit differently than the world's success. Our success is based on the obedience to, to the word and our calling. And we as Christians forget that. Can I, can I keep it? Oh. 
Oh, yeah. Go ahead. I just said we as Christians often forget that. Yeah, we often forget what... Depends on God. That it depends on God, yeah. Not on our... Not, we're not responsible for the response. Yes, good. Um, did you see, starting at about verse 7, Herod is in the picture. Okay. Herod was trying to identify Jesus. What were some of the possibilities that Herod was coming up with? John. John, who was beheaded. Who, uh, who beheaded him? Just to be clear. Herod. Herod himself. Okay. So John the Baptist. Which would have been weird if it was him because he should have been dead. Okay. We thought he was resurrected. Yeah, yeah. What was going on there? Was he was John the Baptist resurrected? Were there others, Jackie? You were gonna say? I was just gonna say Elijah. Elijah. Anybody know why is Elijah significant? He went up to the heaven so he could come back again. He he didn't really die. No. <laughs> he rode a, a I guess you would say a chariot. Yeah. Yeah. He was the prophet of prophets. Yeah. So he um, was a representative of sorts or uh, like the pinnacle prophet, yeah. you could say. And then some other said he just some other prophet. They are trying to figure out who Jesus is. And Herod, and notice that Herod's ideas came from other people. Did you notice that? Some said this, some said that, some said that. So they're trying to figure out Jesus, and Luke is kind of setting the, up this thing of who is Jesus. Now, the, does 12 come back? They seem to have ministered. It seems like they've healed people. It seems like they've done all this sort of thing. And then, can someone read verse uh, 12 of chapter 9? Who could read verse 12 of chapter 9? Late in the afternoon. Thanks, Mike. Late in the afternoon, the 12 came to him and said, Send the crowd away so they can go to the surrounding villages and countryside and find food and lodging because we are in a remote place here. Good, thank you. Okay, so there's a lot of people around Jesus at this time. They want to send people home. Well, what do you think of their idea? Good idea or bad idea? Well, from a human point of view, it's probably a good idea because they uh, knew they didn't have food for all the people. So it would seem a logical thing to do would be for the uh, send the people home. Jesus made it even more ridiculous by saying, because they, they said he doesn't, there's nothing to eat here. It's desolate. Is what my Bible translates it to, or barren, desolate. He says, "You give them something to eat." What? Well, <laughs> yeah, you feed them. I don't know if you also noticed the day. Mine says the day was ending yes. in verse twelve, so it's late. Late in the afternoon. It's late. There's not much time if we're going to send them home and they're going to get home, you know, before too long. And maybe find something to eat. And they had forgotten what Jesus had just done. <laughs> uh, what's that? What, so they had forgotten so... Well, the way... Um, <laughs> Got to find that. She's finding the page, I think. Yeah. healed a woman and Jairus' daughter and he'd just been doing all kinds of healing himself and miraculous things. Yeah. In the last chapter. 
So Jesus has just been do doing a lot of healing. Right. A lot of things have just happened. Right. They had just done a lot of healing. Yes. They themselves. With his power and authority. With his power and authority. So they shouldn't have been surprised. Mm -hmm. well, they haven't seen a feeding yet. Right. I don't think. But uh, this is a pretty, it feels like a big ask. Or I can see why they might be surprised <laughs> or shocked at this ask from Jesus. Yeah, yeah for, for, particularly at this point in their relationship with him. Yeah. If, if they knew him deeper, I mean, uh, and understood the power that was being oh, used. Now we have to call you out. Yeah. I don't know, I was trying to shout. <laughs> uh, the, the power, what are the power for them doing yeah. the, uh, uh, their own healing? So it's coming from scaring up a meal would have been trivial. Yeah. Uh, to, to raise somebody from the dead, for yes. out loud. But see, this is brand new to them. Yes, that's true. Now, just to uh, foreshadow something coming up, has Moses ever fed people? In the wilderness, what was it? What did they get? They got manna, manna and, and quail. Quail. Manna is what? Bread. Uh, bread, essentially. It's a what? Yeah, manna literally means what is it? By the way, if you didn't know, in Hebrew. Okay, how about Elisha or Elijah? They had too. In fact, a bread miracle. So it's not unknown in scripture for prophets to have fed people from somewhat nothing. Okay. All right, so they did, uh, they went through with this. Did you see, uh, I noticed at the end there was some leftovers. You notice that this happened at the other miracle. How many specifically? Did anybody notice? Twelve. Twelve. One for each of them, potentially. So there was an abundance, and uh, there was even more than they needed. Okay, so that just happened. And notice in mine it says in verse 16 at the end, he blessed them uh, and broke and giving them to the people, uh, to the disciples to set before the people. My last word is people. I don't know if yours says crowd or something like that. Crowd. Yeah, so crowd or people. Now, look at verse 18. So mine uses the translation people. Who do people say that I am? So we just had the miracle with all these people, and now he's asking who do people say that I am. Okay? Why does Jesus care about this? Let's just be clear. So why does Jesus care? What do people think about him? Because you could almost say, well, Jesus, don't get overwhelmed by what people think of you. You don't need affirmation from people. He's not going for that. What is he going for? Is he God or is he some sort of a magician? Yeah. Is he a magician? Is he like a, a slot machine that you just pull and hope something lucky comes out? Praying for a good result for something. Okay. Peter answers, uh, you're the Christ of God, or yours might say the Messiah, or God's Messiah, or God's Christ. Had anyone figured out who Jesus was at this point in Luke? Peter. Peter's the first. I think he's the first human, I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong. I think the other people to figure out who Jesus was is at the baptism. Remember the father from the cloud? Uh -huh. And I think there was a demon. That's right. Right? So this is the first human to figure out who Jesus was. It's pretty interesting, right? He's third after the father and a demon. Okay? So it, you think they're maybe getting it. And then he warned them. What, what do you all make? Could somebody read verse... 22. And 
he said, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. And he must be killed on the third day, uh, and he must be killed, and on the third day be raised uh, to life. Mm -hmm. Yes. This uh, sort of talk comes, from, comes up from Jesus a few times in this chapter. What's... Uh, why does he need to tell the disciples this? Maybe that's what I'm saying now. Why does Jesus need to get at this point? This goes contrary to their belief. They, they thought that he could uh, turn out to be king, you know? It could be, it seems like it's contrary to their belief because so far they're not engaging with the suffering part of Jesus, which is huge and confusing because how would a king suffer? Because he's still a king. How could a king suffer? And also, yeah. they're identifying with him, and they're riding high right now. This is, oh yeah, this is, this is hitting stuff that's going on. They're pretty happy at the end. They're going to be fighting about who's the greatest. So this is making them pretty happy, except for this sort of talk happening right here. Now, not in this passage, but in another gospel, Peter is upset that. Uh, Jesus talking like this. And just a side note, I don't know, those of you who like to eat, did you notice that, so after the bread miracle, there's a, a realization of Jesus' identity by Peter. This happens a few other times in uh, the gospel, and I wrote this in your notes if you're interested. At the Last Supper, they also hear about Jesus' identity, bread broken again. And then you know the road to Emmaus. They didn't recognize Jesus until they ate the bread. So there's something about the food revealing who Jesus is as a theme in, in Luke. Maybe the taking in. Like, it's really interesting. I don't know. Think like we celebrate communion. So there's something about the breaking of bread yeah. and that is part of our uh, Christian, um, what would you say? Like, regular celebrating of Jesus. He's the bread of life. Yeah, He's the bread of life. That's exactly what I was thinking. Yes. There, there must have been something very miraculous going on because when you think about the logistics yeah. of feeding all these people, yeah. you know, only 5,000 men, but other people involved, you know, the women and That's children. That's good. And uh, it's not, it had to be just multiplying, you know, just miraculously. It, it, it was an amazing yeah. miracle, and yeah. all and the... Something about the breaking, see, uh, Jesus must have used the same motions and expressions, and yeah. those men in uh, Ad Emmaus, they could recognize that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it, w it would have been an amazing miracle to witness. Mm -hmm. Let's take a look at the transfiguration now. Remember, uh, Herod was trying to figure out who Jesus was. Uh, during the feeding of the 5,000, there was a discussion of it initiated by Jesus. Okay, let's take a look at the transfiguration now. <coughs> Uh, it would be great if someone could read verses 28 to 31 of Luke 9. 28 to 31. And if you add a mic, that's also wonderful so everybody could follow along. So 28 to 31. Okay. Shall I read it here? Yeah, um, great. <clears throat> now about eight days after these sayings, he took with him Peter and John and James mm -hmm. and went up on the mountain to pray. Mm -hmm. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered, mm -hmm. and his clothing became dazzling white. Mm -hmm. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, mm -hmm. who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, mm -hmm. which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. 
-hmm. Now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep. Mm -hmm. But when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. We'll pause right there. Okay. Uh, so let's take a look at a couple phrases there. Uh, yours said dazzling white, Jesus turned. Uh, did anybody use anything else? As bright as a flash of lightning. Yeah, mine says flashing like lightning. Anyone else? Some, something like that, like bright. Uh, and then Moses and Elijah were there. Okay. Uh, what, what's, what's the significance of Jesus turning colors, bright like lightning, and then Moses... And Elijah being there. I think there's heavy significance here. But what's what have you heard or what do you think? This is a pretty wild story. Yeah, a bit it feels a bit unusual. Well, so I want to make sure we feel good. I mean right to me it would indicate his divine nature. So Why yeah. is that? That's really good. Uh, where have we seen like brightness associated with divine nature? Well, we certainly see it in the Old Testament. Uh -huh. And we saw that um, Jesus appeared to his people as a uh, first of all, on Mount Sinai. And yeah. Moses gave the, the uh, uh, Ten Commandments mm -hmm. and how everything changed there. And then we see that uh, Elijah and Elisha and Jesus um, God displayed, always brought glory. I forgot what the other two things, I think I wrote them down. <laughs> but it's hard to read. Anyway. Oh, that's okay. That's a start. <laughs> okay, yeah. So God, uh, when there's what we call in the Old Testament a theophany, meaning an appearance of God, like an epiphany, but theophany because of God, it, often God is like super bright. Uh, that and remember Moses, what happened to him when he came down the mountain? He was bright too, his face, so they had to put a veil over him. So uh, brightness, or even think of Revelation, when Jesus appears, he's bright like lightning, super bright. Okay, Moses, he represents. Uh, the Torah, or the first five books of the Bible. That was his major area. Elisha, or Elijah, the prophets, and Jesus, I would say, is now fulfilling both of these. Fulfilling this Torah, if sometimes it's translated law. I like the, the word better, story, or it's the Old Testament where the covenant, okay, Mosaic covenant, all those things with Moses and them first meeting God, and then Elijah representing the prophets. Jesus is fulfilling both of these. There's two of them. Does anybody know what's the significance of two in the Old Testament? There's two people here. Two, they have to have two witnesses. Oh, right. Right? Two witnesses to something. And so we have these two witnesses. I made a little, if you're interested, more detail than I'll go over, but on the back of the page, I compared Moses, Elijah, and Jesus. So Moses, if you look at the middle of the table, represents the Torah. Elijah represents the prophets. I believe Jesus fulfilled both of those. By the way, do you remember that Moses got to see God's glory? Right. Does anybody remember how that story went? That bush? After that, he said, like, I want to see you. He was praying, and that's where that famous voice, like, the Lord, the Lord is compassionate and gracious. And that's Exodus 34. It's when Moses got to see, he said, you can't see my face or you'll die. But he saw the back and was full of glory. Elijah had a similar story. Does anybody know that one? He got to see God too. 
It said that there was a, like an earthquake. God was not in the earthquake. There was like a storm or something, a wind. God was not in the wind, but he was in? Still small voice. Yeah, that still small like voice or whisper. And Elijah got to see that. And now Jesus pretty much is that. He is the glory. As I think your passage said, Pete, right? The, the dazzling white. Dazzling white. And uh, his clothing became white and gleaming. Uh, and they also were appearing in glory and talking about his departure. Oh, yeah, please. Um, and, and I think, to me, um, the contrast between the other appearances of God mm. and the transfiguration, yeah. uh, tell us something about the incarnation. God did not put yeah. Peter, James, and John behind a rock so they mm. would not be blown away. Mm. Jesus was still God. That he was God incarnate, God mm. connected so good. with yeah. man so that there was no longer, it, it, it kind of gets in with the tearing of a veil on the temple. You know, it, it's just a changed uh, paradigm. Yeah. yeah. This was, so it was Jesus incarnate. There was not only these two, but remember there was a few disciples with them. Mm -hmm. Peter, John, and James were all there getting to witness this. So, where Moses is the only one who saw this, and Elijah is the only one who saw this, we finally have some other human witnesses to this. And the weird part is, in these two, God, who they weren't seeing, came into the picture in his glory. But here it was Jesus, and he was glorified, if you want to say, or transfigured, as the translation says. But they got to see his glory in the same way these two. So it was a, took a bit of a different experience because there was no existent person that transformed here. But there was here. So super, super interesting experience in that there was an incarnation piece to this that never existed before. So they got to see that both human and God piece. Yeah, they were like, what is this? Now, somehow they knew it was Moses and Elijah. Yeah. Okay, mine says, they, uh, in verse 31, which he was taught, um, oh, they were speaking about his... Departure. Mine says departure, yours says departure. Anybody else? Decrees. Decrees. The word is the same word they use for the Old Testament for Exodus. So the Exodus of Jesus. Remember, Moses had an Exodus, and that represented in the Old Testament. It, they keep referring back to it. If, if you read through the Old Testament, keep on referring back to this Exodus, and that's the time where Jesus, or where God saved the Israelites. So it's uh, described as a salvation type experience for the nation of Israel. And now Jesus is about to have that same sort of thing happen. So they're discussing the plans of his, what would be his death and resurrection, ultimately, in Jerusalem. So, unfortunately, we don't see that when we see the word departure, but it's that same. It brings up that connotation for the original reader. Okay. It says that, uh, now, uh, yeah, they, were, uh, saw, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. 33, as they were leaving, Peter said to Jesus, Peter had this idea to build some shelters. What is that? Is that, was he out of his mind? What, what, what do we make of Peter's idea? He probably had the intention of uh, wanting Moses and Elijah to uh, stay longer. He probably thought if there was a shelter, so they wouldn't go away right away, they'd stick around and he wanted to prolong the experience. Yeah, this, this is a retreat, it's accidental, but 
let's finish the retreat here. Uh, we'll build a we'll build a, a re simple retreat center and we'll just bask. In uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, let me add one. I'm not disagreeing. Let me add an additional aspect. I think to add to the uh, depth of the shelter piece. Does anybody know on the second coming when Jesus comes back in his full glory, where and flies down out of the sky? Where does he land? Does that make sense? He's going to fly in the sky. He's going to land somewhere on earth. Where does he land? Some, okay, uh, just, just in just Israel, like, and what specific location? The temple. The temple. Not um, exactly. The temple. There we go, yeah. Uh, well, in the, that right? Put it here. the Mount of Olives, look at, if you want to follow with me, Zechariah 14. I'm going to look at a couple different verses in Zechariah 14. I think it'll make a connection here in a second. Uh... In verse 3 it says, Then the Lord will go forth and fight against the nations, and when he fights, on that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in front of Jerusalem, to the east, and it's going to break in half, essentially. And there will be a new river that forms right there. Uh, the river come, with waters coming out of Jerusalem. And I don't know if you know what, day, what period of time that will be, but it tells you in the end of Zechariah chapter 14, this is going to occur, it tells you in verse 16 and later in verse 19, this is going to be the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths. So we are expecting the second coming during the Jewish celebration called the Feast of Booths. What did Peter want to do? Build some booths. He, he likely was thinking that this was... Um, this could have been the, the coming. You know, for him, he might not have known like first versus second coming. But this could be the end. Because it was a big event. The, I don't know if anybody like is really savvy on their Old Testament, but the Feast of Tabernacles had two important days. The first day when it started, and then if you read Leviticus, I put the reference in there for you if you want to check it out. The eighth day was the pinnacle. And what day was this in Luke? Yeah, so eight days on verse 28. So there's a couple connections. I think Peter was happy. He wanted to stay there. Uh, he thought, I think he thought this was also the end. And so he wanted to build a booth or a tabernacle or a shelter for everybody. So I think there was a lot of things going on in his mind. He didn't realize that it's not time yet. Because you can't short-circuit the suffering. You can't short-circuit the cross. Okay, so Jesus showed his full glory, but it, it wasn't time yet for him to be glorified, if that makes sense. Okay. Now, look down at verse... Can someone read just verse 35 with the microphone? Verse 35. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. Good. Okay. Here's the, the father. This is the second time we've heard of him after the baptism. Said almost the same thing. I think this is the Father's answer to who do people say that I am. This whole transfiguration and the, uh, this is my son, the chosen one, listen to him. I think uh, we're getting a lot of ridiculous answers from Herod. The people, I don't know if they figured it out. Peter starting to figure it out, but hasn't tied the suffering piece in. And then the father's trying to give an answer to that same question. Who do people say that I am? Well, this is the this is God incarnate, as Bill said. Uh, you saw his glory, just like Moses and Elijah, but they're now standing witness to Jesus. He's a 
when the, the Lord uh, at Jesus' baptism, what did the Lord say? This is my son with him. I'm well pleased. Did he say, listen to him? Not moment? that part. No, just the, this is my son. This is my son. That's right. So, so we, they'll listen to him as new. This is kind of like a passing of the torch or something uh, in sure. a way. Mm -hmm. Say more. What, what do you mean by passing no, no, of the torch? Uh, it's not only on my son, but listen to him. Uh, that's the same as listening to me. Mm. Uh, we're... we're You know, their their view of the Messiah was so crippled mm -hmm. uh, as to what the Messiah was going to be. And here comes <coughs> and I already if you remember, I already told you that this is my son with my well peace. And now he's saying, listen to it. Yeah. The father's giving a lot of authority. Yes. If you can listen to him on the father's behalf, wow. That's huge. That's huge. Father doesn't say that about anybody. Yeah. Just the son. Mm -hmm. Just the son. This all result like Jesus kind of went back to normal looking. And what's the next thing that happened after the transfiguration? Remember, they're on a mountain right now. There was a healing, but there was a problem. It says they could not. There was this discussion, and the healing could not happen. And there was an argument, and some of the other Gospels make highlight a little bit more the back and forth of the argument that was occurring here. Um... Jesus came back, so came off the mountain. When Moses came off the mountain, do you remember what happened? The people had set up the idol. The first time, yeah. They had set up the idol, and there was a mess. Uh, in the same way, when Jesus and those three disciples came off, there was a little bit of a mess going on down the mountain. I... I think that sometimes happens when we have some strong experience with God. I've noticed it. Maybe conferences or you have to resonate. Mm -hmm. The next thing that happens really shakes you or can shake you. And we have to watch that we don't undo a moment with God when a moment on earth happens. Like a mountaintop experience that follows an experience like in the desert. That doesn't undo what just happened. So Jesus has that same sort of experience that Moses did. Uh, Moses was a pretty intense when he came off the mountain, but there was something that had to be resolved here. Uh, and then Jesus ends with, in verse 44, the same sort of talk. Let these words sink into your ears. Remember, he just said, listen to me. <laughs> the Father said that. For the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. But they did not understand the statement, and it was concealed from them so that they would not perceive it, and they were afraid to ask about this. So while a lot of things were happening, not only was it concealed from them, but they were afraid to ask about it. Does that need any interpretation? What do you think? Well, Jesus yes, knew that he needed to complete his mission yeah. on earth, and so he still had, uh, he felt, I think, more teaching to do, more preaching to do, and uh, he wanted to have the time necessary to do that mm -hmm. uh, rather than just have it all uh, culminate right now. Yeah, it wasn't yet the time. Right. It wasn't yet the time. Uh, these statements of Jesus were kind of a prophecy, and they and the uh, disciples didn't understand it. But after it all happened, that see this was a faith builder, and after it all happened, because they could look back, they could see. But well, this was not just an accident. This was planned. This was the way. 
Yeah. God had ordained it to happen, see, so uh, Jesus was not a victim. He willingly laid his life down, see. Yeah, this was a prophecy. Yeah. Really. It was something that was going to happen, and it wasn't a happy. In, in a humanly sense, it's not a happy prophecy because he's going to suffer. Yeah. Now, ultimately, it would be a good result. But in the time, uh, suffering, even Jesus at Gethsemane, it was a lot. Yeah. You could see. Bill, I, I think I, probably a good I think this is a time to stop. Exactly. Well, and this is. A, I mean, how can we go further? Yeah. 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 I, oh, Charlie's going to clean up any mess that I like. Exactly. Is that right? Exactly. That's he'll, fine. He'll things out. Yeah, he'll straighten things out. Uh, should we pray? Did you want to pray, Bill, or did you want me to pray? Would you pray? Yes. Yes. Lord Jesus, thank us. Thank you for this time where we get to think through. Who do we say that you are? And how do we live because of it? Lord, I pray that we would live a life uh, that sees you in your glory. That you suffered for us and were glorified. That um, uh, you have done all this for your church and your people. Lord, may we live in that and not be discouraged by the difficulties and suffering that comes our way, but knowing that we're also on our road carrying the cross as you did. I pray, Lord, that we can uh, learn to lose our life for your sake, that uh, we wouldn't want to profit from gaining the whole world, I pray that we would not be ashamed of you, but that we would await you when you come in glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.